There's nothing I hate more than scuff marks on a wall. Scuff X delivers superior scuff resistance in the most challenging high traffic commercial environments thanks to its patent pending scuff resistant technology. Yes, there's people in the lab somewhere thinking about how to keep scuffs off walls. When we're running around like crazy, there are actually scientists trying to figure this stuff out and no one's done it better than Scuff X. I would not endorse this product if I didn't believe in this product. It, it, as a hotelier, it is so important to solve this problem because we spend so much money, so much time on painting hotel rooms that we finally found a solution. And I don't think anyone does it better than Scuff X. The high-performance Scuff-X latex paint reduces the need for touch-ups, repaints, offers significant savings on long-term maintenance costs. And for all the information you need, go to BenjaminMoore.com. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn, teaching you to be the hotel you're that you wanna be. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn. Welcome back to checking in with Anthony and Glenn. How you doing, Glenn? I'm doing great. So, uh, you know, I'm excited. We got another great episode here. Uh, and one of the things that I want to achieve by this show, because we're called checking in with Anthony and Glenn, is we're going to talk about all these different topics today. I want to talk a little bit about what goes on with hotel management and all these mistakes that potentially hotel employees can make that'll either mess up their careers or mess up guest experience. You know, Glenn, I asked how you're doing. You're like, I'm doing all right. How you doing? Honestly, I'm I'm really spending a lot of time trying to uh, cover up childhood wounds, and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make it through this show, Anthony. Well, actually, Glenn's doing very well because I when I saw him this morning, I said, "How you doing?" He goes, "I had a great swim. I'm doing great." So he's doing great. Yeah, no, I am actually doing great, but I hate saying I'm great because then I feel like it's going to ruin absolutely everything. But I'm having a great summer so far, Anthony. And it is just the best time. I had a I barbecued last night. I had I had a couple of beers. I swam some laps in the pool. Just totally chill. Nice summer evening. And his children and his wife were in Israel, <laughs> so right. he had a very so, good time. So I left that I left that out. I, I love my family so much, but I'm a, I'm a singleton. That's uh, the new way of saying only child. And I I very much need to have my alone time in order to be func to be able to function properly in situations such. So as this send one. my wife and kids to Israel. Got it. All right, good. All right, uh, so we're we're learning. This is this is great. We're already checking in, making things happen. But Anthony, uh, you're the hotel uh, expert from that management point of view. You've been doing it for 30 plus years now? From 1987 when Bob Legler gave me my first job at Overland Park, Kansas at the Embassy Suites and Bob Legler is still a very good friend of mine to this day and he saw my tie, he goes, I love your tie and uh, so since 1987 because of Bob Legler, I am uh, still uh, kicking around hotels. So you, uh, as, as they say for that insurance commercial, you know a thing or two because you've seen a thing or two. I've seen a thing or three. Yeah. <laughs> So let's talk about um, some of those uh, those mistakes that could uh, be made that are going to cause irrevocable harm to people's careers or the guest experience. That commercial you just talked about, what's the name of the insurance company? Uh, Farmers. Very good. Thank you very bop, much. Bop, bop, bop. I was trying not to give them a. Uh, I was trying not to give them a pitch because they're not. Uh, they're not sponsoring the show. <laughs> unlike HD Supply, which is an amazing sponsor, and I want to thank them so much for being a part of this. HD Supply is great. Get all your needs met by HD Supply. And I'm so glad they're our founding sponsor. Thank you very much. And we'll hear more from them on the commercial break. But, um, you know, I do know, I do, I actually do like those uh, farmers uh, commercials. I think they're very, they're very creative and they're funny. And it's very hard for companies to be funny and for you to remember their brand at the same time. And they've done a great job, I think, of pulling those things together so I actually know them. And, of course, they got that, that catchy theme that you just sang. Right. And uh, the reason I asked you what the name of that company was because I actually forgot the name of it. But I, <laughs> I love the commercial. But to answer your question. Yeah. And your question was what, Glenn? What are some of the major mistakes that GMs make or just people within the, the hotel business are making at the property level? Okay. That's a great question, and it's something that I talk about a lot in my keynotes and a lot in my training and a lot on the show, and I may go a little, uh, I may get a little angry, I may get a little excited, uh, a little cause, enthusiastic. Because right now, the passion is oozing out of you. Yes. Oh, you feel it. <laughs> um, was, that a, was that a slight? But this is, this is, I just said this the other day, this is the problem 
what's happening with general managers. General managers are people who are usually um, on time. They're usually the people with the most energy. They're really excited about the hotel business. And they get promoted because they've done some really cool things. They've been able to be counted on. And I'm not talking about the Four Seasons general manager or the person that goes to a branding uh, company and just like a Marriott and just really they brand you Marriott or brand you Four Seasons. I'm not talking about that general manager because that general manager gets a lot of training. What I'm talking about, um, well, I am talking about that general manager, but really what I have in my head is the general manager gets promoted without the skills to do their job because, like I said, they're on time, they're passionate about the right. business, they're good with the employees, they're fun to be around, and all of a sudden they're in their they're in their office and they have to deal with marketing. They have to deal with accounting. They have to deal with human resources. They have to deal with an owner. They have to deal with EBITDA. They have to deal with insurance. They have to deal with a lawsuit. They have to deal with TripAdvisor. They have to deal with all these things, unions, non-union hotels. And don't and, forget, and guests too. Ugh. Oh, yeah, that's right. Those <laughs> guests get in the way every once in a while, right? Those guests yeah. get in the way. So they're, they're business people. They're businessmen or businesswomen, and they're sitting there, and they don't have the tools to do their job always. I know I came up through uh, hotels, independent hotels, right. typically as a general manager. And um, I didn't have the tools. So the first thing I went to um, was my street smarts. Well, my street smarts also comes with some anger and some... Um, I was going to say, uh, beating up your guests if they disagree with you is probably not the best way to engender loyalty. And, and, and it also comes up with insecurity. Yeah. So I'll tell you a really quick story. The first mistake I made as general manager... Um, I, I was at the Lucerne Hotel, and I fired an individual, and uh, terminated, or as I say, promoted to customer. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> and uh, you can basically come in, you just can't work here anymore. So I promoted him to customer, he went downstairs to the locker room, and he uh, changed into civilian clothes, and on the camera, because I had a camera in my office, I see him at the front desk. So, so I go downstairs, I go uh, to see him at the front desk, and he looked at me and he said, "You're allowed to fire me, but you're not allowed to take my spirit." Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that as long as I live, because he basically said, "I was letting my insecurity and my inability to do my job get in the way of being an effective leader, being an effective manager." That must have been a very transforming moment for you if you still remember it all this time later. Oh, it changed my life. It changed my career. It changed everything about me because I made it about me because I didn't have the tools to do my job. And I don't mean right. money and I don't mean uniforms and I don't mean employees. I didn't have the tools to be like, how do I deal with firing someone? How do I deal with disciplining someone? How do I deal with accounting? How do I deal with, with all the stress that I have and deal with gas and do it all at once? So I wasn't trained to do that. That gentleman, and to this day, um, I think about him, I think, I, I, I see his face clearly, um, gave me the best training in the history of my career because I realized I was insecure, I was making it about me, and I was um, not being very nice. I, I probably, I, would, I don't drop curse words at people and I don't Just scream me. and yell. Off camera. Just you, yeah. right. <laughs> um, and I said, um, I said that, that moment, I was like, I'm not gonna be that guy. So the first mistake we make as general managers, whether you're coming up through a really great brand like a Marriott or Four Seasons, or you're coming up through independent uh, hotel owners who sometimes are whacked out of their mind, um, you, your job is to hold yourself to a standard, port yourself in a really uh, professional way. And when you are overwhelmed and when you are um, don't have the skills to do your job, go in a corner and cry. And take yourself out of the game. Figure out who's best on your team to deal with that issue and get out of your own way. I always talk about getting out of your own way because that to me is the... the Joe manages biggest problem. So how do you actually do that, though, get out of your own way? Because I think a lot of what we do is instinctual and with inertia. So once you start going down that road, it's really hard to hit the brakes and stop and take that time what out. You, what you do is you, you immediately stop and you say, 20 minutes from now, 10 minutes from now, 5 minutes from now, are you going to have a guy at the front desk or a girl at the front desk saying, you took my spirit? Right. So I never want to be that guy. I never want to be the person where I regret 
something I did. And I have regrets like everyone else. And I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But I try, as I get older, to limit my regrets. Mm -hmm. And I think the number one priority, the number one regret I try to eliminate is trying to put my insecurity and my stress on other people. So um, is there a magic bullet? You know, will yoga help you? Will will riding your bike help you? Will swimming help you? Whatever helps you get to a right. point where you're, you're alleviating stress, do that. But the one thing you're not allowed to do is you're not allowed to take what's going on in your brain, in your mind, in your in your family, and put it on somebody else because they have their own problems. What you're allowed to do is you're allowed to take the person in your office and tell them in no uncertain terms why they're not meeting the standard. You don't have to be rude or disrespectful, but and that's another that's another thing that people don't do well is they don't discipline well. They they maybe acknowledge you and they and they they celebrate you, but they don't like confrontation. And one of the things I find with general managers is they don't like confrontation. So the second thing I would say is when you're in a position to to discipline someone, take it as. Um, you're doing them the greatest favor in the world. I want to talk about that um, avoiding confrontation thing for a minute because that actually strikes close to home. I have a problem with that. I would. So rather, when I say "fuck you" off air, you don't like get mad at me. Why? Uh, because that's not really real confrontation. <laughs> that's just that's just joyous wordplay. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's you know I, I find that the. Um, the more that you like someone, the more um, horrible things you could call them as, mm. because it's done in that spirit. But in the in the real world, when you're actually dealing with confrontation, I find that I have uh, – there are certain times when I feel like I'm, I can handle it and I'm getting much, much better as that over, over the years. But there was a time where I would just sh be a shrinking violet and I wouldn't deal with it and it would wind up causing me additional hardship and problems in my life because I didn't know how to handle that situation. So if you are that person that doesn't want to upset that apple cart, to use a, a really old cliche, how can you get yourself out of your head to be able to communicate to those, those employees in such a way that makes them learn without feeling like they're being attacked? The first thing you have to do is you have to, and, and I don't know how to train this because I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not Dr. Phil. Um, you have to be okay with who you are, yep. right? In that, that moment, doesn't mean you have to be the greatest parent or the greatest uh, bowler or the greatest bowler. Who the hell's a great bowler? Uh, Chris Hardwick's father. Okay, great. There you go. <laughs> uh, you really do have a lot of stuff up there. I know. But my my point being is, you have to show up to work being clear, right? Right. And once you do that, you have to ask yourself. What am I trying to achieve? So if I am, I know it's going to be confrontational and I know I'm not good at confrontation. Right. What am I trying to achieve? It's so funny for a guy who has a TV show that featured a lot of confrontation. No, I'm talking about you because I'm, oh, I'm, okay. uh, I'm good at confrontation. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, okay. So me, not I so love, much. I, 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 I hate and love confrontation. Yeah. I hate confrontation with my family. I hate confrontation with my friends. That's right. I hate confrontation with people I respect and love. Um, I enjoy confrontation when I'm turning around hotels because the confrontation is needed. So my point being yeah. is the confrontation is needed or the discipline is needed. So what you have to do is you're going to say, what's my why, right? My why is what's going to motivate the conversation. So if I know I'm, I don't really want confrontation, I'm going to be soft-spoken anyway because I'm avoiding confrontation. There's nothing you're going to be able to do that about that. Right. You're already going to be timid going in. There's nothing you're going to be able to do about that. And if I say, well, read these talking points, you know, and then go in there and be prepared, you're going to be like, right. um, okay, what I'm supposed to say to you right now is that you're not doing yeah. the very – so that doesn't work. It's got to be organic and feel natural. Otherwise, it's not going to – Go work. in with your personality. Right. But know the why. Know why you're doing what you're doing. This isn't working out anymore. There's been three times where you've been written up, you've been suspended for three days, you're not, unfortunately, the right person for this position, you're great at this, you're great at that, but this isn't working anymore. And, you know, we have to terminate you or we have to, we have to um, go on different paths. Do you think I'm being fair to you? And what do you have to say about what I just said? Now, I said that in a way for someone that is a little bit more timid than I am and a little bit more um, nervous about confrontation, right? How I would say it is, um, okay, I love you, man. 
great job. You've been here for so long, but I've written you up three times. Yeah. I don't know what the hell got into your brain, but you have one shot right. to convince me not to let you outside this door and never, never turn back and you can't work anymore. Tell me why I should allow you to keep your job, okay? And that's how I would probably handle it, all right? But if you're a person that's, because now that may, that may encourage confrontation. Right. Because now I'm putting it in his in his lap, and he's probably pissed off at me because I'm being a little direct, and I'm basically letting him know, or, or I'm letting her know she's being fired. So I'm okay with handling that confrontation because I know I have my ducks in a row. Yeah, but some, but so many people, unlike you, are uh, insecure in regards to that because we have this incessant human desire to be liked all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I run a little bit on a higher scale of having that need mm -hmm. to to be liked, and and. I, as I try to move away from it, I find that it does hamper my ability to be as successful as I could be because I'm worried about what people think of me. And in this particular situation you're talking about, I think that that's really a fundamental problem. I had to fire somebody once in my life. It was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. And it really affected me uh, extremely negatively because not only did I not agree with it, um, I was forced to do it. And I just didn't like anything in regards to it. And I, I, years later, I still feel terrible about it. Well, we're talking about two different things. Yeah. You were put in a situation. Right, and you're where, talking about someone who deserves right, it. Right, you're, you're, and that's where maybe I would have stood up and right. I wouldn't have fired him. I would have got fired. Yeah. Right. There are opportunities where you put yourself in a position where you're going to get yourself fired for, for your employee. So that's a different conversation. Yeah. What I'm talking about is where you have to be comfortable with the why and once you're comfortable with the why it gets you through that you may not do it perfectly you may not do it appropriately but to your point is if you want to be successful you have to do it i am not interested in being liked i'm interested in being respected mm, and one big of the, difference and one of the things a huge and difference. i think people get that confused all the time it's a huge difference and one of the things that's worked for me and i think if i've had any success it's because whether you like me or you don't like me, and there's people listening to this podcast right now that work for me that like me and will work for me tomorrow and work for me today. Um, and there are people. And then that, there's people like me who are really not so thrilled to be working with. Right, you. exactly. <laughs> and I don't blame you. Yeah. But there are people who uh, don't like me and will not work with me. Okay, but whether it be producers, whether it be That's general right. managers, whether it be owners, whatever it is. But what I am, and you can ask every single one of those people. Is he who he is? Is he authentic? Right. And uh, whether you like me or you don't like me, they think I'm authentic. And that I am authentic. And that's the most important thing to me. So I can lay my head down at night knowing that people dislike me or like me based on me being me because there's only right. one me and I can't be anyone else. So my advice, and when we're talking about you know the, the, the things that – um, general managers sometimes make a mistake with is they're trying to be what the brand is telling them to be. They're trying to be what their supervisor is telling them to right. be. They're trying to be this perfect human being. Just be you. I say this all the time. Get fired being you. Don't get fired being someone else. Right. So if I get fired being me and I've gotten fired two or three or four or five times in the same uh, career field, I probably have to go home, have a glass of wine or a beer or scotch and say to myself, this career field is probably not for me because it's not the career field, it's me. Let me go into music. Let me go to stand-up comedy. Let me be Joe Rogan and do a podcast. You know, let me be who I am naturally born to be. Don't try to fit yourself into a box that doesn't fit you. That's right. Um, and let's just take a break right there. We're going to hear a word from our sponsor and we're going to come right back. <laughs> What's important to me is relationships. And HD Supply has had a relationship with me for many years. Anytime I worked at a hotel, I was general manager, developer, whatever I was doing, I call HD Supply and they have over 100,000 products. Anytime I need anything, whether it be logo items, whether it be guest room supplies, whatever it is, they're there. I need an oven or I need a bathroom, they're there. They have over 100 certified master hotel supply professionals to help you. Real people that have worked in hotels so they can help you and really understand what you're going through. They have the tools, the technology, and the specialized service. And I truly believe in them. First time I spoke to HD Supply, I said, we have zero listeners by advertising for us. And said, well, usually we need to know how many listeners you have. And what I said is we may have one or we may have one million. We don't know. Give us a shot. They did that. That's loyalty. So whether they're supplying your hotel or whether they're being a loyal friend after all these years, they're the company that I go to bat with. 
Okay, so you're 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 talking about being yourself, and one of the things that I find difficult, Anthony, is um, actually being yourself. Now, me, I think I'm 100% fully myself because I've allowed that process to happen. But when a person's old enough to first achieve that general manager job, they're probably a lot younger than I am now. So I I think that there might still be that struggle of understanding your authentic you and how to do everything in life being that authentic you. So how did you achieve that? I outworked everyone, and, and that's a really great question, and I never actually thought about that before. I outworked everyone. So I compensated for my insecurity. Now, just so the audience understands, my dad died when I was two. I was on welfare food stamps. You know, I have you know all kinds of issues growing up. Right. Um, I got left back twice, once in first grade for being sick, uh, in, a senior in high school for being, you know, partying too much. And so I was older than most people, and I joined the Air Force, and I was like, I can't come out of the Air Force and not have a college degree. So I went to college in the Air Force, was in the Air Force one airman of the year, and I worked uh, at MC Suites in, in Overland Park. So being an employee at Overland Park, Kansas, working in that hotel, MC Suites, being in the Air Force, which is a full-time job, and taking a full uh, curriculum in college – uh, at Park College, Park University now, um, was pretty intense. So I was working um, a lot. Well, so does everybody in the hospitality industry. So in going to school, being in the Air Force, and um, working in a hotel, I was outworking everyone. Right. And I was preparing myself for battle. Not knowing it, but I was preparing myself for coming out of the Air Force and going to battle, going to battle with those people that were two years ahead of me in school, going to battle with those kids that went to Ivy League College, going to battle with the kids that went to Cornell and father went to Cornell and whose mother went to Cornell and they were going to get the, the cushy jobs at Tishman, right? And they're not cushy jobs because I eventually got a job at Tishman and it's not cushy. It's, it's an intense job and you have to be really smart. Thus, I'm not there anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so... For me, how when you're asking, you know, how did you overcome being insecure and not having the tools was I just worked really, really hard. And by moving really, really fast, um, you're doing so much that you're not really um, for me. I wasn't doing a lot of thinking. I was doing a lot of doing. So people in my early career were really impressed. I would come in at 6 a.m. in the morning. I would get that group ready at the Plaza Hotel. 500 people coming in. The key package would be ready. Uh, everything would be set up. I would make sure my employees you know, were on point. Their uniforms were ready. And I would just keep working really hard up until you know, 12 o'clock at night until making sure the next day set up. So for a long time, I didn't really have to think. I just had to do. Right. So the time I was uh, doing, I was winning some some promotions and I was winning some battles. So the time it got me to think and I was in positions where I really had to be creative and I really had to think, I was confident because I was doing so much and I was accomplishing tasks and I was being promoted over people um, that should have been promoted for me because I outworked them. Now what I try to do in my business is outthink people. Right. But you can't outthink people until you have confidence. I didn't go to, to a great school. I didn't have people saying I was smart and I can accomplish anything. So I had to, when I was in the Air Force, I remember the first week being in the Air Force, these people, there was a couple of guys being picked as squadron leaders, and I was in the back going, well, first of all, they won't pick me because I'm hiding in the back in tears. And second of all, how do these squadron leaders they just got in the Air Force too, and they're going to take over a squadron of 20 or 30 people, and they're going to march them, and they're going to talk to them, right. and they just got in the Air Force too. How in God's name do they have the capacity to do that? Well, as I now I have children. As I get older, I see because through sports and through education and through um, uh, a, a network of people, you're giving p- these kids confidence. I didn't have that confidence, so how I did it was I outworked everybody until I had a couple of wins under my belt. So when you get those couple of wins under your belt and you're outworking, outworking, are you actually, from outworking, learning enough that when you achieve that position, you actually have the skill set required in order to do it? I'm going to say probably not, so then what? Um, I 100% disagree with you. Okay. I watched people doing it above me, and most of the people above me were doing it wrong. So how do you... 
and that's kind of how I've learned in my career too, by seeing what people do wrong and then trying to do what your gut tells you is right. But how do you actually do that? Because I think in our society, the way that we're raised, the way that we go to school is do it this way. This is the way it's done. And there's never a reward for doing it differently and going counter grain just because you know it's right. You're supposed to get on board with the plan or get on out. And and a lot of times I did get on with the plan, right? But it was for a, a goal, not a common goal. My goal, right? My goal was I was going to win, right? And what did winning mean? I don't know. Give you an example though of kind of how it started to really uh, identify itself. Um, I was at the Plaza Hotel. I was working um, for a Joe manager that I didn't have a tremendous amount of respect for, uh, and he had probably maybe forty mid-level managers throughout the Plaza Hotel were fired within a couple of years. I was there. And I said, I am not going to be fired. I am going to leave on my own terms. And I don't like this guy, but I'm going to beat this guy. And how I beat this guy is for me to say, uh, thank you so much for the position. I now have another position. And it was a great opportunity. And that's how I left. And I left on my terms. I sucked it up. On Sunday mornings, I remember this clearly. I don't know why it was Sunday mornings when I was there. I would sometimes throw up in the bathroom. I would cry because I was so stressed out. And everybody was getting fired or laid off. And I was surviving because I was playing the game. So there are times where you have to play the game. But I was being authentic to myself because I was going to beat him. I was going to win. So you have to know when you're willing to get fired and move on and say, this isn't for me. And I win by saying, screw you I'm out that was not this I'm at the Plaza Hotel I'm 27 years old it's my dream job and uh, I just got out of the Air Force I don't have a lot of money I'm getting married no way am I getting fired from the Plaza Hotel I am dying you're beating me you're shooting me you're not firing me because I am going to I'm going to outwork every human being in this building that's what happened to me so uh, did you learn a lot of those lessons in the uh, the Air Force that they, then you were able to apply to that part of your career? No, I learned a lot of lessons uh, not wanting to take a block of cheese on Tuesday and getting a welfare check. Um, I needed money and I didn't want... I didn't want the plaza to be on my resume for the rest of my life saying, hey, I was terminated. And somebody would know that I was terminated. The plaza for me was the golden ticket. You know, to this day, I have a TV show. I have podcast. I have a book coming out. I have keynotes. I have all this stuff going on. Um, I have a consulting business. Um, when I say I work at the Plaza Hotel, everybody says, wow. Yeah. So I knew internally instinctively that right. I needed to live through right. that. So just, so, for, just for the record though, I'm not impressed. I think it's a crap hole. That place, um, you know. okay. Well, um, <laughs> uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. <laughs> no, I, no, what, no. What but, an amazing but, but, hotel that is. And I can see what a dream it must have been because the plaza just symbolized New York City luxury and elegance yeah. in particular in that particular time frame. So yeah, what symbolized for me was you made it. Yeah. Right. And, right. That, and now this kid, you know, maybe he's going to do something with his life. So there's no way. It's like being a Navy SEAL. I can't imagine what the Navy SEALs go through. But when you have that in your head and you're like, you're going to have to kill me for me to to to, to uh, get thrown out of buds, which is Navy SEAL training. Yeah. Um, I felt the same way about the Plaza Hotel. You're going to have to kill me to get me out of here because I ain't going peacefully. And when I do go, it is going to be peacefully on my own terms. So to get back to our content of, of the mistakes people make, they, they, they now right there I could blow myself up. I knew internally I needed I needed this more than they needed me. Then there's going to be opportunities when you're insecure or where you don't have the skills where you're going to have to get out of Dodge because you're going to blow yourself up. So maybe you need to resign or maybe you need to get out of there beforehand because you know you don't have the skills. I knew I had the skills to stay. I knew I, I had the work ethic to stay. Um, so it's really it's really about knowing when. To, like there's there's times where you're so frustrated. So many people talking about the water cool, about the boss, and about their environment, and this place sucks. And those people that leave and they never get good jobs again. And then there's people that say, "I'm going to suck it up, I'm gonna, and, but I'm going to go out on my my own terms." And then there are people who just stay there and, and endure the misery. And there and you have to understand what part of your career you're in. Right. 
Yeah, because earlier in my career, I definitely put up with a lot of misery because I saw it as a building block to the future like you did with the Plaza Hotel experience, right? You've got to, you've got to take a, a certain load of, of junk from people until you are a fully formed uh, professional, I think, till you get in those 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell talks about in his books and become that expert in your field when you actually – don't just have false confidence. You have legitimate understanding of what you're doing in, in your field. Right. And I think another mistake that people talk about to get on to, to another thing, I think really people um, just they, they just hold on. They just hold on mm-hmm. to I'm right even when they're wrong. That's right. I have such an easy time with I'm wrong. You're right. Mm-hmm. And the reason I have an easy time with that is because it gives me power. Right. The second I say, after an argument or discussion, you're right, I'm wrong, I just took your power. Mm -hmm. Because all you have right now is your idea and your ability to to, to show me that I'm wrong, and so now you have power. And once I realize that you may be right, and even if you're, maybe I don't really think you're right, but it's like not worth the fight, you're right, I'm wrong. Oh my God, that is the greatest thing that's ever happened in my career. The first time I realized that that was... The biggest, um, the biggest thing I can use, the biggest muscle I could use, was you're right, I'm wrong. I was at a, um, I was in a meeting. I was, I was arguing with the director of sales. I can't remember exactly what, what hotel I was in, but I remember there's a lot of people around. And me and the director of sales, she was a, a very, very good director of sales, very tough, and she wasn't taking any of my crap. Mm-hmm. And we're going back. You're wrong. All right, right. And now it's getting to the point where I'm being inappropriate because right. I'm getting getting Everyone's intense. getting all annoyed. It's right. just becoming a pissing match. You're right. not we're, really achieving the goals that you set out for. And which is good because she knows the director sales that she can have that pissing match with me and not worry about getting fired, even though I'm the general manager or, or vice president, whatever I was. Like, it's okay to go after me as long as you have your facts in order. And she did. And as she's turning red and I'm turning red, she said something. And she was 100% right. It wasn't like I was giving it to her. Right. I said, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Let's move on. She wasn't ready to move on <laughs> because she was still arguing her point. And I said to her, I said, you're right. I am wrong. Let's move on. I apologize. Mm-hmm. And she thought, she didn't say this, but I just knew that I was just trying to, you know, just trying to move on and just trying to, you know, make her look foolish, right? Which was the opposite. And I told her, when you made this point, I realized you were right, and I really, truly apologize. What did that do in the room? Forget I, about what it did for her. I would hope it would diffuse the situation. And But more importantly than that, life, it was a life-changing experience for everyone in the room. One, the director of sales felt validated. Right. Okay. Number two, the young managers in the room realize you can go up against the crazy little Italian Joe manager and win if you have your facts in order, okay? Uh, and number three, it showed me the power of you're right, I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I apologize. That is the greatest power that we possess as leaders is to understand when we don't have all the answers. You know, you can talk about all the training manuals you want. You can talk about all the leadership, keynote speaking engagements you've gone to. I don't give a crap about any of that. You have to make people feel human and you have to make them feel wanted and cared for. And nothing makes them feel wanted and cared for when you acknowledge that you made a mistake, they're smarter than you, and let's move on and let's use your idea because my idea was stupid. So then I guess the next question is how do you separate um, your ego from all of this in order to achieve that? You know, and, 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 and the answer is I don't know because people have been Yo, right now, look what's happening in politics. Look what's happening in our country. Look what's happening in Fortune 500 companies. Ego is so in front right now. Right. Everybody has got an ego. You can't be on the left. You can't be on the right. If you ever, if you have a, a conversation on the left that may be going towards the right, okay, they'll throw you out of the club. If you're on the right and you have something that's going to the left, they'll throw you out of the club. So everybody's talking with their ego. So I don't know how to get people's egos in check. I can tell you how I got my ego in check. Yeah. I want to win. Yeah. I want to win. And, and no one wins by themselves. It's a team effort. So if you want to win, then you've got to understand fully what your positives are, what your negatives are, and be cognizant of that when you're bringing it into uh, other people in their Listen, relationships it, with it, them. We'll use our relationship as an example. We've been friends yeah. for a number of years now. We've worked together. We've done things together. We've known each other. You have a podcast. I don't I have a TV show. You want to do a TV show? I'm the guy. Right. 
I have a pod, you, I want to do a podcast, you're the guy. Right. So I said, let's partner up. I don't want you to teach me the business and me go on and do my own show. I want to do it together. Mm-hmm. I want to learn from you. I want to I want to accept, and I don't always agree with you, and I don't always think that maybe we're doing a show that's perfect. Maybe it's not the show I would do, although I really can't think of one show I didn't like so far, mm-hmm. but that's not the point. The point is, I'm in this as a team. We're going to talk about it. We just had, we just had a conversation off, off mic, and you said, what do you think? And I said, whatever you think because you've done this before I don't care and you're like right. but I was like I don't care right. because whatever you decide even if we make a mistake I want to make a mistake with an experienced guy so to me is that putting my ego aside no that's saying I want to win at this podcast game I want to use experience I want to be a team player right so what you're actually doing then is you're supporting your ego by saying oh I need to learn this and this and this and if I get in the way of it I'm not going to be able to acquire that particular skill and that feeds the ego as opposed to what some people might say is if you're insecure that it's uh, uh, against your ego. Yes. And to put it in, um, uh, to go back to my military career, one of the things I've learned, I didn't realize I learned this until years, years later. Um, Leaders in the military have to lead, but more important than leading, they have to follow. Okay. Think about this. There's a general, right? Four-star general, he's a leader, but his greatest attribute is to be a follower. When General Schwarzkopf, remember him? Yeah, of course. Okay. When he was- uh, He was uh, in the first Gulf War. He was in charge of, uh, of the military. The night that we invaded Iraq, do you know where he was? No. He was sleeping. He was sleeping. That seems unusual. No. When he was asked a day later, a week later, whenever it was, it's okay. And, and the reporter said, okay, General, bring me to the troops are there. They give the order, action, war starts. Right. Where exactly are you? What bunk are you in? Who are you with? Tell me right. what's going on. He goes, I was in my bunk sleeping. And the reporter goes, you were What? He goes, yeah, I was sleeping because I did all my work. I did my job. I talked to the president. I talked to the other leaders. I talked to the Congress. I talked to everyone. Gave them the why. I talked to my logistics guy. Gave them the support. Gave them the tools. Gave them the men, the women. Gave them everything they needed. The only thing I can do is get in the way. I went to sleep because I was friggin' exhausted. Right. And I knew once it started, 12 hours from now, I needed to be fresh. So I went to sleep because I trusted my people. Right. That was a great lesson to me when I heard that because he was a follower. He was like, Hey, I'm going to sleep. If you need me, I'll be over here. These guys got it. These girls got it. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. That's what we have to do as as managers, as leaders, as people that own businesses. One of the things that pisses me off the most is when people say, "Well, I went out of business for my empl- because of my employees." Bullshit. Bullshit. Right. The reason you went out of business is because you suck because you got in your employees' way. You didn't give them the tools, and you thought the hotel business or whatever business you're in is is, is an expense business, not a revenue driving business. I know in our business, the, the the hotel business, it's a revenue business, not an expense business. What I mean by that is you drive top revenue, and the expenses take care of themselves. That doesn't mean you go and spend fifty thousand dollars on a boat that the hotel doesn't need or or 200 million dollars on you know an entertainment center that that the, the resort's not going to need that means that you drive revenue you drive experience i've learned that so that's yeah. that 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 to me is is people don't understand being a leader and being followers the same person all right uh, that's a, a fascinating way of of really putting it so in order to be a great leader you also have to be a great follower you have to and you also have to trust the team that you have and again i think that's another place that um ego might get in the way is not trusting people to do what they do and i've worked for a lot of micromanagers in my life and all that's done is damage the process it infuriates the person that's working for you it ruins their it it makes them feel like that you don't have enough confidence in them to do their job it doesn't allow them to excel it doesn't allow them to surprise you with how awesome they are because you are holding on to something for your own ego as opposed to what's right for the business you know and as and as a person that's fighting against that you have to know am i pushing the button and when i push the button am i willing to take the consequences jack welch the great GE executive said, um, every decision has a consequence. Good or bad, everything has a consequence. So I don't push the button very often, but when I push it, I'm in, man. I'm in. Come on, let's go. You want, you want, you want this? I want this. Let's go. Good or bad. So if I'm ready to push that button and fight, okay, you're going to have to, blood's going to have to be coming out of my ears because I ain't backing out. Right. 
Are there other, uh, uh, but when I say yes, I will do this, you can be assured that I am your best follower and I'm going to hug you and kiss you and I'm going to love you and I'm going to take care of you because I agreed to, to be the follower. But if I'm going to be a leader, I'm going to fight and my people are behind me. You know, I, I always say, you know, if, if, if you're going to go up against me on, on my good day, you're in trouble. If you're going to go against me on my bad day, you're in trouble. Right. Uh, that's a great point, too, because you have to know when you're having a good day or a bad day. Because some days I feel totally in sync with the universe, and other days I feel like I'm stuck outside and observing life. But, but my point being is when you press that button, when you yep. have a good day or a bad day, it's your obligation to commit to it. So what general managers, you know, I don't think do right all the time is they don't get their ego in check. Right. Uh, they don't stand up for their team. Right. They have insecurities that they bring to the job, mm -hmm. and they don't allow themselves enough space, enough air to think and to and to 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 to, to be uh, productive mm -hmm. and be proactive and not be reactive. So those are the things that I think a lot of the general managers n nowadays are, are, are you have to be aware of. And also, there's another word. Uh, that I think general managers are addicted to, and it's called millennial. And they're looking at, uh, I think the mistakes general managers are making now is they're allowing owners to design or, or service a hotel for a millennial. And, and we've talked about this on other podcasts, but I'm not a millennial, but I want the same things other people want. So general managers have to be able to stand up. Like we're sitting in a room right now at the paper factory in Long Island City doing our podcast. And as I walk around this room and I'm looking, I'm looking at you right now, and this room's kind of a hip, cool hotel, and I'm looking at an amplifier that's actually a refrigerator, and I'm looking at a 1950s microwave, and then we're looking behind me, there's this big 1930s uh, light that looks like yep. it's on, you know, it looks MGM like the bat Studios. signal, <laughs> like MGM Studios. Yeah, and it's a really cool, funky place. Now, um, a very big uh, band just stayed here um, just last week. The biggest band in uh, country music just stayed here, and this room. I would imagine whether it was a millennial in the band or whether it was an older person in the band would have loved this room because it was kind of cool and funky and it's interesting whether you're young or you're old. So I think the general managers today, leaders today, are not standing up for what they believe in. And the most important thing um, is to have facts. Right. You have to have facts. And and some people, they'll go into a meeting and they'll like they'll give you the emotion. They'll give you... <laughs> it's so funny. It's so funny you say that because I spend a lot of time now, especially when um, I'm talking to people in the online community about, let's talk about places from facts, not feelings. So what are the, the facts? You're not going to... You're not going to persuade people. You're not going to motivate people. You're not going to get people to do what you want them to do with feelings alone. You've got to have the facts behind it. And I learned that at Tishman. Being a Tishman is the first vice president of uh, asset management. If you went in with anything but the facts, you didn't have a long career there. Um, emotions doesn't get you anywhere. It's all about the facts. And I've said this from early on. Um, I've never made a decision in my life. Okay, the numbers... And the facts have made a decision. So if we want brand new uniforms and it, there, it's $100,000 because it's a major resort and someone says to me, but why can't we have them? Right. Well, this is the fact. And I can give you the fact. If we drive revenue here, then we can have, because nobody wants uniforms, new uniforms worse than I do. So I think we have to have facts. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. Any other uh, tips that you could give folks? Yeah. When you do have your facts, there's this little potion that's called gut. In this mm -hmm. little potion. That's right. Because I feel it and it's the right thing to do. So you come to me and you say, hey, I know we don't have the $100,000 in uniforms. Um, you explain that to me perfectly. Thank you very much. But this is why I think we need them. And that's why we need to take the hit on the expense. And we need to take hit from the owners because right. this, that, and the other thing, right? Yep. So, so facts are great and facts are important and facts drive the ship. But also, that's when you push the button and say, I'm going in my boss's office and I'm going to try right. this again and say, we need these uniforms and this is why. And I think that gut instinct is actually an accumulation of facts built up over a lifetime. That's it's it just a, a physical manifestation of all the knowledge that we, we've learned. And I've learned personally, every time I've not listened to that gut, that little voice that was telling me what to do, that's the only times that I've really run into big problems. Your gut keeps you out of trouble. It really does. 
Because my brain gets me in a lot of trouble. Yeah, except for <laughs> except for when it wants chicken and waffles, then uh, <laughs> then I wind up getting into a lot of trouble from from that. So, uh, Anthony, any uh, final words to uh, wrap up the show with? Yeah, tell me something I don't know, Glenn. Um, tell you something I don't know. Uh, probably about. I think we should keep it in the vein of you know uh, of work and management positions. I, I think one thing that we you you don't know is how many years I've pretended that I've know what I'm doing when I didn't really know what I'm doing. And it comes down to that issue of having confidence. And I think I've always put out a lot more confidence in life than I actually felt I deserved to put out there. That would be something you don't know. Now you tell me something. They call that fake it till you make it. That's well, right. Well, I'll stay in your, I'll stay in your lane and I'll say 29 years old, Joe Maggio, I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay. Going to Tishman as an asset manager at 43 years old, have no idea what I'm doing. Going to a production company, a studio, going, I can do a television show about the hotel business, and I can do it really well, and I have no idea what I'm doing. And I did all pretty well. And so you have to trust your instincts, trust your gut, but you have to take a chance, man. You yep. got to take a chance, because if you don't take a chance, you, 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 know, you can't... You, you, if you trip going forward, at least you're going forward. You can't trip standing still. And I'll tell you what, for the vast majority of people, I'm sure that you all feel like me. You feel like you are pretending. You feel like you are faking it. You feel like at any moment now they're going to figure out you're a fraud. Guess what? You're not. You really do know what you're doing. I mean, I still think I'm a fraud. You know, literally, but, you know. coming to this podcast this morning, I was listening to Joe Rogan. Right. And he was talking to, um, I can't remember exactly who he was talking to. Was that the Macaulay Culkin? But, no, it was, it was after Macaulay Culkin. But it was, it was interesting um, because they're both, uh, this gentleman's an actor. Actor. He's a he's a punk rocker. He's a comedian. He's all these things, and he writes books and he's all these crazy things. And they both were talking to each other. Like, Don't you still feel like a fraud sometimes? Yeah. And they both agreed. Yeah. So I think that's what's the motivation of of keep going. Is is you're not a fraud. I'm not a fraud, but I don't know a lot. So if I keep working and I'm around great people, and then one of the things that we that we didn't talk about, and I know we're ending podcast now. But one of the things we didn't talk about is. What keeps you from being a fraud? And I'll tell you what keeps you from being a fraud yeah. when you don't know something. Is surround yourself with great people. That's right. And that's such a like, oh, yeah, okay, sound great We've people. We've heard whatever. that about you. Never be the smartest guy in you the know, room. And, and great people don't mean people who are the smartest. It doesn't mean people who are, are the bravest. What it means is a person that's going to put you in the corner and say, why don't you just shut up right now? Right. I got this. And just get out of the way. So... Um, I don't know if we accomplished here, Glenn, but uh, I think we may have uh, done something. I think we may have done uh, something, that's for sure. I'll tell you what, Anthony, I think I learned a lot. I thought this was very interesting. I, I, I really got great insight to how you think as a human being, how you've approached your career, and what uh, you know, folks that are looking to climb up in any business, either hospitality or not, can really use in order to build their careers and make themselves better professionals that really connect better with the folks with that they're working with. You know, and I, and I say this, and I don't say this really flippant. I always say, if you if your life sucks, you suck, right? And and it really it's true. Yeah. If you can't get a hold of your career and of where you want to go, um, a couple things are happening. One, you're not really paying attention to who you are and what you really love doing. Number two, you're just surrounding yourself with the wrong people. Or number three, you need a vacation. Right. And you know what? I think uh, number three, I definitely need a <laughs> I definitely need a vacation. I'm going away for a few days at the end of this month. Can't wait to do that. But I, I think that we next time I want to talk to you um, in an upcoming show about how you made sure that you didn't get stuck in the cycle of poverty, how you managed to break free from when you were in welfare. So I want you to think about that. We're going to talk about that in another show because I think it's going to be really insightful and revealing about who you are, and I like nothing more than putting you on the spot. I'm going to cry a lot, guaranteed. Excellent. Um, and, you know, uh, if you want to reach out to us, check us out. we got a great Facebook page that we just launched. we got a great uh, Instagram page. Checking in with Anthony and Glenn. You can find it at uh, both of those. And, of course, you could just send us to our individual uh, uh, our individual accounts as well. I'm at Traveling Glenn on Instagram, Twitter, on Facebook. You can find me at No Vacancy News. Anthony, how about you? Anthony Hotels everywhere you want to be. All right. Excellent. And I want to be hanging out with you, and I'll see you uh, next time. And thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll be back. Man, that was a good show. Love this stuff. Take care. Have a great day. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn, teaching you to be the hotel you're that you want to be. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn.